happens when you add randomness to an already paradoxical supertask? How can you accomplish an infinite number of tasks in a finite amount of time? By performing a supertask. Here's what that means. You do task number one with 30 seconds, half a minute, until noon. We can fit the infinite number of remaining tasks before noon if we perform them as follows. Do task number two with a quarter minute until noon, task number three with one eighth minute until noon, task number four with one sixteenth minute until noon, and so on. Your infinite number of tasks are completed by noon. There's a great Vsauce video on super tasks. Of the many super tasks highlighted in that video, my favorite is the Ross Littlewood paradox. I want to tell you about a randomized version of the Ross Littlewood paradox, but first, here's the standard deterministic setup. You have an infinitely sized urn and an infinite supply of balls, numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. We are going to place balls into the urn and remove balls from the urn in a very particular way. Step one, half a minute before noon, place balls numbered one through 10 in the urn and remove the lowest numbered ball, ball number one. Step two, one quarter minute before noon, place balls 11 through 20 in the urn and remove the lowest numbered ball, ball number two. Step three, one eighth minute before noon, place balls 21 through 30 in the urn and remove the lowest numbered ball, ball number three. Repeat this procedure over and over. How many balls are in the urn at noon? Pause here to think about it. Somewhat paradoxically, the answer is zero. Why? On the first step, you remove the first ball. On the second step, the second ball. On the 18th step, you remove the 18th ball. And on the nth step, you remove the nth ball, which means that all of them are removed after infinitely many steps. Of course, if you just added nine balls each step, the urn would contain infinitely many balls at noon. That's what makes this setup feel so paradoxical. The order in which we add and remove balls makes a big difference. It determines whether there are zero or infinitely many balls in the urn at noon. What happens if at each step, you remove the highest numbered ball instead of the lowest numbered ball? On step one, we add balls one through 10 and remove ball 10. On step two, we add balls 11 through 20 and remove ball 20, and so on. How many balls are in the urn at noon? Infinity. Infinitely many of the balls, any ball whose number is not a multiple of 10, will never be removed. Here's your challenge problem for the day. On each step, you add nine balls, in order, and remove the ball whose number is the median of the numbered balls in the urn. That is, it's the middle when they're lined up in order. How many balls are in the urn at noon? There's a literally infinite number of variations of this problem, so we don't have time to review them all. But here's the big point. The order you add and remove balls from the urn matters a lot. It determines whether there are zero or infinitely many balls left at noon. What happens if the order is random? On step one, you add balls one through 10 and remove a ball uniformly at random. Each ball has a 1 10th chance of being removed. On step two, you add balls 11 through 20 and remove a ball uniformly at random. Now, each ball has a 1 19th chance of being removed. On step three, you add balls 21 through 30 and remove a ball uniformly at random. So each ball has a 1 29th chance of being removed. Then we ask the same question. How many balls are in the urn at noon? Pause here if you want to think about it. To solve this stochastic super task, we're going to need to do some calculations. Let's focus on ball number one and compute the odds that ball one is still in the urn at noon. There's a 9 tenths chance that ball one is not selected in step one. That is, there's a 9 tenths probability ball one is still in the urn after step one. What's the probability ball one is still in the urn after step two? That it wasn't removed in step one and wasn't removed in step two. Well, and statements in probability usually correspond to multiplication. So you take the 9 tenths probability that it wasn't removed in step one and multiply it by 18 nineteenths, which is the probability that it's not selected in step two. What's the probability ball one is still in the urn after step three? 
it had a 9 tenths times 18 nineteenths chance of still being in the urn after step two, so we multiply that by 28 20 ninths, which is the probability that it's not removed in step three. Continuing this pattern, the probability that ball one is still in the urn after step n is this big product. So the probability that ball one is still in the urn at noon after infinitely many steps is this infinite product. Multiplying these infinitely many numbers together, we get zero. Details in the description. There was nothing special about ball number one. We can do a similar calculation for any other ball and the result will be the same. For any natural number n, the probability that ball number n will remain in the urn at noon after the infinitely many tasks are completed is zero. Now, let's compute the probability that ball one or ball two or ball three or ball four or any of the other balls remain in the urn at noon. Well, remember how and statements in probability roughly correspond to multiplication? Well, or statements roughly correspond to addition. In this case, the probability that ball one or ball two or ball three or ball four or any of the other balls remain in the urn at noon is at most the probability that ball one remains at noon plus the probability that ball two remains at noon plus the probability that ball three remains at noon and so on. Well, that's just zero plus zero plus zero plus zero and so on, which is zero. The probability that any one of the balls, ball one or ball two or ball three or ball four and so on, remain in the urn at noon is zero. In other words, with 100% probability, all of the balls have been removed at noon. Technically, it's possible to have balls remaining in the urn, but the likelihood is so small that it has zero probability. Remember from our episode on making probability mathematical that this is like hitting a single infinitesimal point on a dartboard. It's possible, but happens 0% of the time. So with probability one, removing one ball at random actually results in the same outcome as always removing the lowest ball, which seemed like a very particular procedure with a paradoxical outcome. But the paradox persists in the stochastic or randomized supertask. At this point, you might be thinking, this is silly. You can never do a supertask. You'd need an infinite urn and infinitely many balls, not to mention that you'd need to complete these tasks in an infinitesimally small period of time. And physics tells us that time and space aren't infinitely divisible anyway. These are great objections, but the limitations of physics don't have to stop mathematicians from puzzling over the strange possibility of infinities. Many great mathematical achievements have come from stepping outside of the realm of what's physically possible. Hi everyone, we have an announcement to make. We're now on Patreon. If you're able to, it'd be fantastic if you could donate a dollar or two each month. And if you're able to donate even more, we have some great rewards, like Google Hangouts with the Infinite Series team, your name in the credits, and on-camera shoutouts. That financial support is really gonna help us keep the show going. But you can also just keep watching the show. That's also amazing support. Hello. Before we get to the comment responses, I wanna make a quick announcement. We're gonna be taking a tiny break next week, but that's only because we're preparing a special series of episodes. The week after, we'll be releasing three episodes on the same topic, on your brain. And I'm really excited about them. I think they're really cool, really fun science, and I think you guys will like it too. So hold tight. All right. So now I wanna to respond to a few comments on our episode about the honeycombs of four-dimensional bees, featuring Joe from It's Okay to Be Smart. So, Low Tech made a cool comment. They said, what would a 2D slice of a Kelvin and a Ware Phelan structure look like? It isn't as pretty as a honeycomb, I bet. 4D bees need more aesthetics. So, it's a little funny because there's a point to this, that the Ware Phelan structure has a sort of irregularity that hexagons don't. Hexagons are very nice and symmetric. And so they do have some kind of aesthetic that this Ware Phelan structure doesn't. 
But I also liked Daniel Shapiro's response, which showed a lot of intuition about the ways to think in different dimensions. So he said, 4DBs would be able to see the entire 3D structure, just like we are able to see the entire 2D structure of the hexagons. To 2D creatures, the two-dimensional hexagonal structure would just look like a zigzagging thing. They would not be able to see the whole thing at once. They would think that the two-dimensional arrangement was ugly. So if you haven't read the book Flatland, you should check it out because it's exactly the same kind of two-dimensional intuition that Daniel Shapiro is talking about. Professor Politics and several others ask, why do the 3D solutions have a concave bit to the shapes? So the two-dimensional solutions that we looked at, like the squares and the hexagons, only use straight lines. But the 3D solutions, both the Kelvin one and the Werfelin structure, have curved or bulging sides. And those are actually required by something known as Plateau's Laws, which study soap foam and the shapes that are possible for soap foam. And I'll include a link in the description with more information about it. 